Section 11 of A Rip and Winkle of the Kalahari Seven Tales of Southwest Africa by Frederick Carruthers Cornell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Fortune. Section 11 The Country of Craters, The Path of Skulls, and the Snake. Part 1 Filled, as I could but be, with thankfulness at my escape from captivity and from an awful death, I did not realize for a time what the loss of the diamonds meant to me. Indeed, I was too exhausted by my terrific struggle to do more than crawl a few yards away from the brink, throw myself down in the sand and sink into the sleep of utter weariness. But with my awakening, the bitter truth was borne upon me in a flash. All my struggle had then been in vain. I had won my freedom, but had lost all that would make life bearable. Even if I could win back through the desert, what had I now to compensate me for the horrible disfigurement that would make me shunned and despised a leper amongst my fellow men? Bitterly did I regret my pleasant prison down below. Surely it would have been better to stay there in peace till I died, as fate had apparently decreed, and if I could have done so, I would certainly have returned, but to return was impossible, and I must make up my mind to struggle through the desert or die where I was. Moreover, in the midst of my bitter reflections, there came the comforting recollection that I had still the blue diamonds that I had kept apart and put in my pocket. Eagerly, I felt for them. Yes, they were safe, and in themselves, they must be worth a fortune. My spirits rose with a bound again. Why should I dream of giving in? I was strong and hard, and if I could win through, the diamonds would surely enable me to fit out an expedition in return, and with ropes, the descent into the crater would be easy. Rested by the cool of the night, I felt little the worse for my climb, and was all eagerness for dawn to break, that I might see what manner of country I was in, for I had been half demented when my terrible ride from the pursuing sandstorm had brought me into it. At last daylight came, and I saw that although in the midst of a wide sandy plain there were no dunes, scattered bushes grew here and there, and dotted about in the distance were a number of bare granite rocks. The crater I had climbed from went sheer down at my feet so abruptly indeed, and with so little to denote its presence, that within a few yards of its brink nothing whatever could be seen of it. I looked once more into its depths, to where the pool lay dark in the still, dim light of dawn, and from it my eyes followed the course that I had taken in my climb, and I marvelled that I had ever reached the top, and a great thankfulness rose in my heart and drowned the unworthy regret that I had felt at the loss of the diamonds. And with a last long look at my late prison, I turned and made my way towards a prominent pile of rocks in the distance, from which I hoped to be able to see more of my surroundings. My water bottle was nearly empty already, and the old haunting dread of thirst was beginning to fill my mind. But soon this fear left me, for within a mile I found Tassama flourishing, and at the first pile of rocks a little spring of water. Cheered and encouraged, I made good progress in spite of the now blazing sun, and soon I reached the pile of rocks. And to my astonishment, I found that they formed part of the margin of a crater almost identical with the one from which I had escaped, deep and inaccessible and with a mass of vegetation filling the bottom. This discovery gave me food for thought. It had never entered my head that the queer place of my imprisonment had been one of many, and I had thought that once I could reach even a friendly native tribe where some kind of rope was obtainable, I could locate the crater again and secure the bag of diamonds but I had already stumbled upon another crater, and maybe there were many. 
and this indeed I found to be the case, for they became more numerous as I proceeded, until the whole country was pitted with them. They were of all sizes and depths, some mere pits of fifty feet in diameter or less, some huge gulfs a mile or more across, and so deep that it was difficult to distinguish what was at the bottom. Invariably their walls were sheer, and I could explore none of them, but in nearly all I saw the gleam of water. So numerous were they as I penetrated farther into this strange country, that I was forced to make wide detours in my endeavour to avoid them, and so bewildering did this labyrinth of huge pits at last become, that I became hopelessly lost among them, and at times thought that I should never break clear of them again. Day after day I wandered about this vast and apparently level plain, finding every short distance a huge yawning gulf at my feet, forced to try new routes, and constantly being pulled up by similar obstacles. And all this time I saw no sign of life, not even a spur in the sand, to show that mankind had ever trod there. There was no animal life even, a few birds and a few snakes. Nothing more indeed so deserted and dead was this weird land that it appeared unreal, and often I imagined that by some strange chance I had been transported to some other and long-dead planet. So little was this maze of craters like Mother Earth. I had food and water enough, and as the moon now gave plenty of light, I walked only at night, resting in the shadow of the rocks by day. One night I had made better progress than usual, having walked for some hours without having to deviate from my path, and was beginning to hope that I had escaped from the labyrinth, when suddenly, at my very feet, there yawned the usual abyss, but this time so huge that I could scarce make out the farther cliffs, though the moon was full and it was almost as light as day. It would mean a long and weary detour, and my heart sank as I thought of it, then leapt as it had not leapt since the day I found the diamond by the pool in the crater. For there, in the misty depths, far away towards the farther cliffs, twinkled a fire. A fire, yes, and I had seen no fire except of my own kindling since the night that Inyati had died. Months, months, surely it must have been years ago? Here at last must be human beings, savages maybe, but still flesh and blood like myself, and if they were in the crater, there must be a way down. That night I walked as I had never walked before, following the brink of the chasm, and scarcely taking my eyes from the tiny flame that meant so much to me. A way out, a way back to civilization, to life among beings like myself. All this it would mean to me, even if I found but savages by the fire, for they could put me in the right path, and it never occurred to me to fear them. Now, as the broad moon rose higher, I could see into the crater's depths, and this, besides being more vast, was not as the others I had seen. Its floor appeared to be quite level, and looked to be of pure white sand, but everywhere it sparkled in the bright moonlight. Diamonds, surely? I was near the fire now, though far above it, and now I could see there was a path, a broad white path, down a steep slope. It must be broad to show so plainly, for I was still a mile or more away. In my eagerness I forgot my fatigue, and hastened panting towards this first blessed sign of man's handiwork that I had seen for so long. Here it was at last, a broad white road, running straight as an arrow, away across the sands in the one direction, and leading down into the pit on the other, a road paved apparently with round white stones, all of one size. Something in their appearance struck me. A loose one lay beside the path, 
and I stooped to examine it. It was a skull, a human skull. The whole road was paved with them as far as the eye could reach. There were thousands upon thousands, myriads of them. And as I realized what they were, fear seized me and I turned away from this terrible pathway. At last I threw myself down in the black shadow of some rocks, still trembling and agitated, and tried to compose myself to think. What manner of men were these I had found at last, and who watched there below by the fire? What race was this that thus made grim mockery of their dead? At length I overcame my fears sufficiently to return not to the path, but to the edge of the crater at some distance from it, and peering down could see that the fire was still burning, and here, hiding as best I could, I waited till morning. Daylight showed me no sign of life, however, though still the pale flame flickered, and I could now make out that it burnt before a sort of building which seemed to be of white polished stone. Till well after broad daylight I lay and watched, but nothing stirred, and I determined that I would go down and see what manner of fire was this that burnt day and night without tending. End of section 11. Recording by Leanne Fortune, South Africa.